both Steves. Thank you, both Steves. Tonight, Dr. Strong, Assistant Professor of uh, uh, Teaching in the Department of Anthropology at UCI is gonna present. The title of this presentation is Archaeology in Interim Spaces, Excavation and Pedology at the Historic Bonita Camp Site on the UCI campus. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Strom specializes in the archaeology of the Middle East post late antiquity and developing pedagogical innovations in training students with interests in the archaeological record. His research has included excavation and survey in Syria, Jordan, Armenia, and elsewhere focused on the Islamic periods at sites such as Petra. Other projects have included work with Arabic manuscripts from Timbuktu in connection with the British Library's Endangered Archives program, as well as the politics and practice of heritage across the Muslim world. Since joining UCI in 2017, after more than a decade as a faculty member with Brown University's Tchaikovsky Institute for Archaeology and the Ancient World, his work has explored new approaches to engaging and training undergraduates in archaeology through object and project-based learning. Examples include Egypt Domania Postcard Project, the Tomb of Social Sciences, I Dig UCI, as well as collaborations with archaeology team of OC Parks, Orange County Parks. He received his doctorate in anthropology from the University of Chicago. Would you please give a warm welcome to Dr. Ian Strong? Ian, it's your, all yours. <laughs> Ian is on mute. <laughs> I hope you hear me now. Oh, and, and I'm in, in stereo with Echo. Yeah, you're loud and clear. Okay, yeah, well. Excellent. Okay, well, so thank you, Joe, and thank you everyone for attending and welcoming me to um, this. Okay monthly meeting of PCAS. Have a great evening. Storied uh, Society for, for Archaeology in Southern California. Um, so Joe did basically my first slide for me. If I can advance these slides. There we go. Um, a little bit about me, which is that, yes, my archaeological training and research has largely been focused on the Middle East. Um, I've worked at the uh, site of Petra. Um, in Syria, this is, this photograph at the top is just one of someone's uh, mansion in northern Syria well, before before the terrible civil war and the atrocities, where they had basically recreated every famous ancient monument in their in, in as part of their their garden. Um, and yes, I also had a stint working um, with Arabic manuscripts, some of which um, were in Timbuktu. I was working with the collection there. And I've done many other projects, some experimental ar archaeology with um, uh, these particular vessels here, sphere conical vessels um, that have long been talked about as grenades, but I think they are really just plain old lamps. Um, so there's a, a little bit about the, the, the work that I work that I do, it, in part to say I am a newbie when it comes to the archaeology of Orange County um, and the historical archaeology of the of the, the Irvine Ranch, um, but I've felt that it's something I need to be involved in as a, you know, a faculty member and one of the, the few archaeologists um, in, at UCI. Um, fortunately, we've recently hired um, a couple of new archaeologists, both in the art history department and in my home department, the anthropology department. Um, so I'm, I'm actually really excited to be here with all of you because 
you have the expertise and the experience that will help to really flesh out some of the, the work that I'm doing, trying to train students, getting them to know the kinds of um, archaeology that they are going to experience if they go on further um, to, to work with any of the various CRM firms or go on into uh, work in the public sector. Um, so this is you know, really a great opportunity for me mostly to learn from you. And if I have a few words of wisdom in, as part of that, great. But my, 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 my suspicion is that pretty much anything I have to say, someone here in this audience or on Zoom knows more about it than I do, but you know, we'll pull it all together. Um, yeah, so this was the, the abstract that I shared with you, and we'll, we'll probably do some of this. Um, mostly it's a, a, an opportunity to talk about what are the oldest standing structures still on the UCI campus, which are these three farmhouse buildings that probably go back to the early 20th century. Um, our first uh, clear Photographic evidence, I think, is 1930, but they're probably um, a little bit further. And how that that Bonita camp became part of the UCI campus got utilized, particularly by the School of Social Sciences, which is where the, the Department of Anthropology is housed, um, for an experimental uh, ethnographic laboratory, and then. Um, I don't know, there may well be some of you in the audience who either have sent your children to the farm school or were, were somehow connected to the farm school that was run by the School of Social Sciences for some 30 years um, until 2007. What I'm really interested in is the way in which this particular spot of the UCI campus has continued to resist being enfolded into the master plans whether they be the big master plan of the, the city of Irvine and the Irvine company, or the kind of plans that the regents of the University of California may have that they play, put out every so often in their, their long range development plans. Um, and what that affords us as faculty who do work on archeology span to actually tr treat the campus as a classroom and to treat the campus itself as an archeological site writ large with many known sites that have been surveyed and documented um, over, over the years. So ultimately the, the, the big question I'm hoping that you guys will help me with is what, what's gonna happen to this space? What's gonna happen to these buildings? Because as we are probably all well aware, the land is really valuable. Um, for future development, whether it be new student housing, new um, laboratories, whatever it may be. And I can, I will, I will let you in on a few secrets of what I think is going to, to happen and what we might do to uh, at least think about the alternatives. So um, let me then step back with uh, a land recognition. Now, first, I should say that this is my own personal land recognition. I do not, not none of what I have to say today it should be taken as um, coming from the University of California, Irvine, the Regents, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is me. I am not speaking as an agent of those. Um, so part of this is that the University of California, Irvine has yet to actually have its own official land acknowledgement. Um, which has been mired in legal questions and many okay. other things. We could get into that yeah. if, if people are interested in that discussion. Um, so this is mine, which okay. is um, the UCI yeah. campus occupies part of the ancestral and unceded territory of the Ahachiman, Tongva, and other peoples of Turtle Island. I recognize yeah. it as territory appropriated from it's their so ancestors by the United States through various acts of violence. I yeah. further recognize my own status as someone who is an yeah. who currently occupies uninvited um, those through dubious yeah. to legal residents. Um, so well, for those of you who well, are familiar with the USI campus, there's a section of it that is known like as University Hills, um, which is where many faculty 
Rest. are able to purchase Why? a house to say the least. land. Why? So we own the house. Like, we sublease um, the land from like the Irvine Campus Housing Authority, who leases back. the land from the regents of the University of California. What if we put the care back um, Ian, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we're getting I'm interference that, from but, one of the viewers. So we need to put I, them on I mute. In, you know, let anyone who considers these lands to be theirs and rightfully theirs, that I accept their right to visit those lands. Um, whether they are ones where my house is or my office, um, they are always welcome in my home, in my garden, um, and so that um, they can come and assess their lands um, and what we what what has transpired on them. And in many ways, much of what I want to talk about today is ways in which we think about those questions of stewardship and how that. Um, ultimately needs to be part of a reconciliation of what has happened to the land over the, the past 300, 400, 500 years. So the site itself, the farm, AKA the farm school or Benito camp. Um, those of you who may be familiar with the UCI campus, it is right here adjacent to the Antietam Recreation Center. Um, something you might be able to get a sense of from this initial. It is in sad shape. Um, the, the three farmhouses have been unoccupied and unutilized since 2007. Um, this particular bit of property here is under the administrative domain of central facilities management of the university. So it's no longer part of the, the School of Social Sciences. Um, and it is adjacent to an area of undeveloped land that I refer to as the wasteland. Um, it's where there's the, the fault line that runs through campus as well as um, many other uh, arroyos and channels and, and basically land that um, has been deemed by and large um, undevelopable. Um, this is a view of it uh, from earlier this year. There's now actually a big dirt mound that has been built up here. Um, the three buildings are really cleverly named buildings A, B, and C. Um, we also now have a couple of shipping containers that can have emergency um, equipment. So when, when the earthquake comes, I know where to go to find all the emergency equipment. Um, it has also been utilized for various other bits of machinery that the university has needed to move from North Campus as they build their the new uh, the the new uh, medical center. Um, and then, as you can see by some of this stuff, the detritus here, um, we do start to see some illegal dumping um, by unscrupulous contractors and others um, on this site. So situating the interim, this is the so when I kind of first realized that we had. These, these buildings in this site, um, I asked, well, what's being done with it? And they said, nothing. Um, and I said, well, I would like to use it basically as a classroom to train students in archeological field methods. And they said, well, okay, <laughs> maybe, I suppose. Um, and one of the things that I started to realize, well, that's simply been the, the case for this piece of property on the campus is that, well, in the interim, you can do what you want, right? You, If you want to run an elementary school experiment, go for it. You want an ethnograph, go for it. Um, just know that someday someone may come knocking and say, okay, you need to do it. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but for the moment, um, it is part of, uh, it, is, it is literally our classroom um, most Saturdays. But let's step back to, I believe this is a, an aerial photograph of, um, from, the, from 1938. Um, so you can see the, the location of the, the original Benita camp that was part of the Irvine Ranch um, up here. And uh, if you're interested, then we have Benita Creek and Benita Canyon Road um, that uh, I would suspect some of you who are local have driven on many, many times and have seen its various iterations over the, the past hundred years or so. Um, and then this was in fact very new in 1938, which is the, the Benita Canyon Reservoir. Um, apparently James Irvine II was really big on building dams. 
Um, so he, he, he tried to build as many as he could in one of the ones, the one here. I suspect there was probably also an ancient dam of some, um, but, but the, the, the chance of finding any archeological traces of that are probably few, though I wouldn't be surprised if someone here in the audience knows something about this. Um, so if you do, I would, I would be very excited to hear it. Um, this is kind of the, the earliest image I've been able to find of uh, Benita Camp circa 1937. This was from a, um, a postcard that um, was, I've seen posted in many different places. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty substantial facility. Um, you know, in, in at least a dozen structures, um, several horse barns, um, chicken coops, et cetera. Mm -hmm. You can see it from the satellite image, right? It, I don't know why it's so blurry on, on the screen, but um, yeah. um, this, this, one of the things I like about this particular aerial photo um, is that it was amended and documented by presumably someone in the Irvine Ranch Company. And they said, okay, this season, we're gonna leave that one fallow. This one's gonna be barley for grain. This is Irvine wheat. So we get a sense of the landscape as it was, right? That would later become the University of California, Irvine, um, where they're, they're doing not only the cattle grazing that was you know, a major part of the, the Irvine Ranch, but also some of the, the agricultural fields that they were able to utilize um, during, during uh, you, you know, presumably they had good enough rains in the winter to actually make that viable. Um, here's that, that camp again. Um, some of the uh, structures that we've been able to um, utilize the historical record to identify. Um, I would love to go and find a sheep herder wagon somewhere. That'd be, I think that would be nice. So if anyone knows where there's a sheep herder's wagon out there, and then I would love to, to get, a, get a look at that. Um, yeah, so Cook House, um, probably the um, major uh, ranch house building, maybe same as building A that I showed you in the earlier, um, in the, the, the contemporary image of the site. Um, my suspicion, is that the three structures that we have still extant are amalgams of some or all of these buildings here. And they have been re retrofitted and redesigned and re as um, the, the university ultimately turned it into classrooms for this elementary school and other things. So, um, but this structure um, that, is often referred to as the foreman's house, seems to have been in that same location for most of the, 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 the lifetime of the site. Um, yeah, you can see it here as well. Um, so this was, a, this was a significant operation, as far as we can tell from, from the, the documentary image, um, which would suggest that they are going to have left, they would have left a pretty substantial archeological record in terms of trash and debris and things of that nature. So keep that in mind as we, 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 we move forward in time. So now the 1960s, enter the University of California. We got three guys getting doing some archeology. span oh. <laughs> I don't know if Dan Aldridge and William Pereira were ever thinking that, that would, they would be confused as archeologists. Um, yes, yeah, groundbreaking. Uh, so, this was a radical change, rupture in the nature of what Irvine, the Irvine Ranch was, because it signaled the transition in many ways from growing crops and raising cattle to a very different kind of operation, making houses, right? Um, which apparently made a lot made, makes a lot more money. So you know um, that's a, that's a business to go into. Um, yeah. So the university takes over this section of uh, of uh, of Irvine, um, and the 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 farm site, right? The what remains of the the Benita camp in its first iteration as part of the campus is utilized as this 
experimental experiment in intercultural exchange um, where uh, informants were brought in from Guatemala, uh, Mexico, um, and a, a Samoan chief who was a boat builder who would actually build um, an outrigged canoe that they would, there's even a video of him sailing it in the upper Newport Bay, if you're interested. Um, and this was the brainchild of one uh, Professor Dwayne Metzger and a colleague of his at UCLA as a way to bring the, the ethnographic to the students rather than students going out into um, the ethnographic. This was also the late 1960s. I wasn't around then, but some of you might have been. What was happening in the late 1960s? Would stop him. Everything else is just... Yeah, we've got the counterculture, the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, um, any number, you know, I don't even, we probably shouldn't even talk about what was going on in Laguna Canyon at that time, but, you know. Uh, and this was when UCI was in its infancy, right? Then we're four or five years into it. This experiment by the anthropologists had started to turn into something more like a hippie convert. Um, you can guess how well that went over in Orange County in the, the, the 1960s. Um, and certainly with the bombing, fire bombing of the Bank of America building in, in University Town Center in 1970, the idea of these radical students on UCI's campus and amongst the, you know, the, the, the burgeoning brainchild of Pereira and the master plan was, was not going to work. So that experiment did get shut down pretty quickly. Um, so it lasted about two years. And instead, what, what do we do at the land? Well, it's going to turn into something else. An elementary school, but we'll get there. Um, but let's put this in context, because in 1963, Ferrer and his team are out there designing both the master plan for the city, what would be the city of Irvine and the, the holdings of the Irvine company, but also the university. And the university in many ways was the catalyst for everything that would come later, right? That, all of the, the, the infrastructure, the drainage, um, utility lines, et cetera, were absolutely necessary in order for the Irvine Company to then um, build out all of those um, wonderful villages that we, we know and love today and, and that were here, right here, in, 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 um, the Irvine Ranch Water District. Um, pretty strange shape. For the university, right? When I when when I ask students, oh, what, what what's the shape of your campus? Almost always, I get the concentric rings, and then they say, oh, this, right? Um, many of you probably know the story of how the university essentially purchased, or the regents purchased this thousand acres for a grand total of one dollar, right? Um, lots of reasons why that. Um, well. If you ask L.E. Cox, who was brought in as basically the, the person who would oversee the, the, the development of the universe, the, the campus um, from the university side, he would say to, to Ferrer, well, the, you realize that the Irvine company didn't give you the best land. <laughs> you get what you pay for, right? Um, and Ferrer answered, well, just think about how much more interesting it's going to be for that. For that, um, why do I say why? Why do we think that it's not the best land? Because it is the drainage, um, and still, right? Like everything here drains out through the center of campus into um, the San Joaquin Reservoir, the marsh, um, and then ultimately into Upper Newport Bay with the exception of just this one little piece here that actually drains into Bonita, Bonita Creek and then finds its way um, out into the, the upper Newport Bay. Um, and still the drainage issues plague the center of campus. Um, and there are efforts to try and raise money to, to, to update the, and, and, and make the storm drains even bigger. 
There's another piece of the land grant process that I think is important to mention, which is something called the inclusion areas. I don't know if any the, the four of you in the room, anyone familiar with the inclusion areas? So yes, UCI got the, the, this original 1,000 acres for a dollar, but they paid several millions of dollars for another 500 or so acres that would become known as these inclusion areas A, B, and C. Um, and in fact, though it was, if it weren't for those inclusion areas, the Benita camp would not actually be part of UCI's campus. Um, the Irvine Company had wanted to hold on to as much of the, 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 the better, more developable land and the land that they were still actively using for grazing um, for as long as they could. But ultimately, um, they made their agreements with the regents. Um, and there's been a lot of land swapping over the years such that by 1989, we get a new sense of what the, the shape of campus is. That includes essentially this part here, which is East Campus. And by the, develop, the, the long range development plan of 1989, which in fact is the first of the long range development plans that actually has an environmental impact report, because the, the, the previous one was 1970, and apparently they got it in before sequel legislation. So they didn't have to do it. Yeah. Coincident, I think. Um, uh, I'm, I'm starting to get, become, you know, really geeking out on things like long-range development plans and the EIRs as I try and get it. Because I'm I'm a newbie to so Southern California, so this is all in familiar territory. I grew up in 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 New Hampshire and New England, so that 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 kind of landscape, you know. So I'm just figuring this out. Um, but some things never actually even happened, despite you know them being written. So Palo Verde Road never extended all the way to Culver. Um, it doesn't include the now Anteater Road um, that leads in. Um, controversial was this uh, piece that would actually connect California all the way through such that it would be a full ring road. We don't actually have that because um, the eco preserve is, uh, one of the things that the, the UCI Faculty Senate was able to pretty much hold firm on was to not let California Avenue run right through our, our ecological preserve. It didn't stop the 73 from getting built and doing all that 73, um, then the toll road would. So as I mentioned, right, this experimental laboratory for, for ethnography and bringing in um, informants from in various um, who were demonstrating different traditional crafts. That didn't last long because too many students were there living, you know, in tents and tree houses and an and old abandoned school bus and all these kinds of things. So instead, out go the students and in come the children. And so here we have the farm setting that it becomes the basis for um, the, the, the farm school that would be inaugurated by Dr. Michael Butler um, in 1971. And his argument to the, the top brass of the university is that, well, we consider it of vital importance that the farm stay as farm-like as possible and that the farm school stay on it. The two farm houses in which the school is located um, were substantially improved and will continue to improve on it, right? So there's this sense of, we're gonna take care and steward what, what remains of Bonita Camp. Um, and then later on, he writes in another document, well, in some we expect the naturalistic but accessible environment of the farm school to be both a healthy reality test for current behavioral hypotheses and a source for new hypotheses which have some prospect of illuminating the real world. I don't know. I mean, do we now live in a, we live in an age of the, the metaverse, so I don't think we have a real world left. Um, you know, all of you there on Zoom, are you real? I don't know. Um, <laughs> or are you just being generated by some AI that, but we'll leave that, you know, this is the 1970s. So. Um, yeah, so this, I think, raises a fundamental tension that is at the, the, the heart of developing and building the campus for a major 
public research university. On the one hand, we have this sense of we want to maintain something of the natural farm-like atmosphere, yet everything else that's going on in the development of the campus and Irvine is more and more urban. And we're going to see that tension continue to take place um, and that this particular site and its future is a good test for understanding the limits of how, how far that tension will go. So the children enter, they're having a grand old time um, doing all kinds of fun Montessori type school type things. Um, there was an attempt to try and mollify the students that they have, would have uh, this uh, an additional kind of uh, student barn structure that would hold it. To my knowledge, it never got built, it just got planned. Um, but the, the, the red barn that you actually see in this photograph and that's still on the site is actually not one of the barns that was associated with Benito Camp. Um, those barns would eventually disappear. This one was a barn that was used by Pereira and his architects to actually do the planning. And they brought it, I believe, from um, where Bison and uh, uh, MacArthur, some, somewhere around there, they brought it in um, to, to, to this set. Uh, so now we have a whole bunch of faculty brats running around roaming free on this part of the campus, which is, in many ways in the, in the 1970s, completely distant from the, the, the life and, and operations of uh, the, the budding UCI. <coughs> it was not to last. Um, the, the, you know, the future was coming and for East Campus in this area where Bonita Camp is, um, that future was the Ant Eater Recreation Center. Any of you ever been to Fort Gaspi? Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's an impressive impressive facility, um, but it would radically alter the nature of that that part of campus. Um, one of the things that I think we can talk safely talk about is that this was a moment in the development of the UCI campus where it decided, the, the decision was made that this there was not going to be any of this rural character to the campus. Um, and I, one of the ways in which this plays out is in some of the, I'll hold them up here. Um, some of the memos back and forth between um, Professor Michael Butler who founded the farm school and the various top brass of the university. So Chancellor Peltison um, in 1986. So. 1986, this is their, the, the university is getting started on its new um, long range development plan that will come out in 1989, um, much of which is about building out the East Campus, these inclusion areas um, that were purchased by the university. Yeah. Um, and he writes, Peltzerson writes to Michael Butler, I understand your concerns related to the area around the farm school. I must note that this section of campus will by necessity of student growth be required in the future for more intense land uses. I would hope as, a, as, as that time approaches, we can plan together for an orderly transition of activities. That did not happen. <laughs> um, because as we, we move closer to the, the inauguration of the, the 89 long range development plan, one of the vice chancellors at the time, Horst Mitchell, um, will report back to the chancellor after all of these committees, that the farm, AKA farm school, the, the 4-H club, fine arts barn, et cetera, um, these, these uses were also addressed as part of the interim use issues at the land use management committee meeting. The policy direction established was that these uses in their present state were not compatible with the long-term priority program needs for this area of the campus, da, 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 da. Therefore they were continued to be viewed as interim uses in the draft LRDP, Long Range Development Plan, as they have been in the past history of the campus. So this is the administration of the university saying, 
we've been telling you since the very beginning that your time was limited. You're not. You're it, it, this change was coming. Um, so now, now, now you have to. Well, that doesn't sit well with um, the dean of the School of Social Sciences, um, who is up in arms and writes to um, the the, vi the vice chancellor for planning. Um, I'm greatly disturbed by the statement that the farm school's present use of its space has apparently been described as interim by and by the implication, since no other provision for space is made, that the farm school itself is an interim program. Both the official category interim and the chancellor committees descri as described as making this determination are new to me. Okay, so... Yeah, tension's brewing. Will there be compromise? Well, this comes to a head in 1997 when the Antietam Recreation Center is, is slated for, for construction. Since that, that building was not part of the LRDP, an amendment had to be made. And with that amendment would come things like an EIR um, and, and various other things. Um, that would, would document at least some aspects of um, what still remained of the, the historic structures and their surroundings. Um, but as you can see from uh, this particular map, um, basically all of these structures that were part of the 4-H club and the horse club and everything, all of them were going to be torn out. All of that had to go. Anything that looked rural was gone. Um, the only thing that would be left were those three buildings and the red barn, um, which was in some ways a concession by the university to let the farm school continue, but only for another 10 years because by 2007, a new long range development plan would come in, the farm school would close down and we would be back to um, uh, farms. So by 1997, the farm school is much more tightly constrained. So that sense of freedom and student and kids exploring and learning by doing um, was gone. And this was pretty much the, the final statement that your days are numbered um, in 1997. The site area can, contains several interim uses, including the farm school, UCI school, barn, blah, 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 blah. Um, UCI facilities management. UCI has allowed these facilities to use campus land until the land is required for campus development under the LRDP. It is anticipated that most of these interim uses will be displaced as development in the East Campus proceeds. So this notion that somehow we can hold on to some aspect of the, the, the history and um, aesthetic of a, a rural setting um, no longer exists. And here's where my students and I come in. Um, given that by 2007, nothing is happening at the site, it is derelict, the buildings are, are crumbling. Um, I get a kind of nudge from my dean and says, hey, you know, what do you think? All right we could do something with this. Um, so I launched a course called I Dig UCI, basically a, free, an, our, our, a field methods training, but also a way to start to get students thinking about stewardship. What is their own role with as, as itinerant members of the community? We're only here two, sometimes four years. Um, do they, do, what, what do they have at stake? How do they want to leave their mark on the university campus um, and things of that nature? So this is a little bit about the kind of objectives that I have set out for this class. One, get them to learn something about field methods where they don't have to pay an exorbitant amount of money to go to a field school, right? I mean, you know, it's it's not, um, it, it's, we're, we're, we're not doing the high tech stuff. They're learning how to walk in straight lines on a transect. Um, then they're learning how to lay out an excavation unit on flatland and on a floodplain, right? You know, these are these are basic skills that 
um, they are going to, to, to use if they're going to start a career, um, get started in doing some CRM work and things of that nature. Um, at the same time, yeah, this is part of documenting the, the campus itself and laying the groundwork for thinking about the campus itself as an archaeological site, um, in, in addition to the many known sites that we have. Um, how do we then think through that history of development, particularly as we move from the Irvine Ranch to a 21st century research university, and ultimately getting students as well as the university to pay attention to what, what, they, what constitutes stewardship of historical and cultural resources. And given my own allegiances uh, in terms of this story, right, about the social sciences, because this was in fact, you know, its history as part of the, the operations and, and the pedagogy of the university was, was rooted in the social sciences. <sighs> so what have we found? Oh my okay. what everyone wants to know. Honestly, very little. <laughs> um, where the trash is, it is not where these three buildings are. That has been reasonably well maintained. And that makes a lot of sense. Who's going to leave all their trash right around where they're working and playing and have kids? Um, so we do not, we don't have a ton of fines in this, this confined space. Um, Douglas McIntosh, there he is. I see you, Doug. Um, right, has has <laughs> I'm so here. on a train, right? <laughs> and she's confirmed my suspicion. Yeah, it's all been pushed down the water courses, the arroyas. All right, then, then, and let let nature take let the water take it away. Um, so unfortunately, those spaces are now have parking lots over them. Um, there are some of the the, the 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 water channels that may be there might be possibilities to put in some 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 test test units or something to see if we can get some stratigraphy. But my suspicion is it's all been dredged, um, and right now it's been all then been filled in with just dense vegetation. You can barely get through it. Um, but students are learning things like how to recognize a rodent burrow. Um, how to uh, identify, okay, wait, we have one of these old, uh, probably, I don't know if that's a gas line or a pan from this image. Um, they're, they're, they're learning the basics of how to, how to document a trench, how to do a, 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 a section profile, um, and all of those kinds of things. And it makes my life a lot easier that I'm not dealing with a ton of artifacts to try and, um, <laughs> you know, so like th this already takes up, you know, a third of the small lab space that I have for, for the archaeology program. Um, so yeah, this is where we work. This is where the houses are. The trash is here. Um, yeah. And we're, we're probably there may be an, an opportunity at some point to find that one sweet spot where we we get it and get and get access to it, but at the same time, we do get to see a little bit of the more recent history and use of this site, um, particularly as it was a school. Um, so we get things like. You know, we documented an old fort that the student, the kids had built um, and what they were doing out there. Happy students. Um, some of my favorite art uh, objects related to play and one of my new colleagues, uh, Dr. Christopher Lohman, is very interested in the, the history of play in Orange County. And so we're going we're, we're to try and connect this up with the kind of curriculum that the, the farm school is offering. Um, I'm a big Lego fan, so I was like, whoa. Oh. Right. And for me, like I knew right away that was Lego date from the late 1960s to early 70s. That was a particular type that only, you know, so. Um, so for me, you know, Lego are the new ceramics. <laughs> but um, and let's see if this comes out. What was that? What was that? One of our special finds was this kind of. A uh, plastic bowl, probably a planter, um, and we were able to, to get the soil sample and then excavate it. What we found were uh, some 
essentially some plastic bags, a few little odds and ends, and most of the skeleton of some small mammal, maybe a cat, maybe a rabbit. Um, our working hypothesis is that this was a class pet that needed, and we know from um, some of the the oral histories and talk, there were goats, they had chickens. So this, you know, so we're we're presuming that this was this was um, something. So, you know, I generally have have no interest in burials and want to stay away from human remains as much as possible. That this is the closest I'm willing to get, um, just given you know all of the the the, the issues surrounding um, that. So, um, you know, if if we're going to have to have burials, like a class pet, it's probably about about the speed that we want to we want to be managing in a course of this of this nature. Um, okay, next slide. Come on, there we go. Are you ready to see the arc? Because it's returning. This is a promotional video. So what's the future of this site? I've only recently learned that the, the arc is looking to expand um, and that they will probably put forward a referendum to the students to ask for the students to vote on that would essentially mean that they would vote for future generations of students to accept new fees to pay for the expansion of this book. Um, yeah, uh, it, it's an age-old strategy that the universities use to 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 get buildings built, right? Um, so, no. um, you know, some more of this because you belong here at the Arc. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah. See. Yeah. Anti to recreation. So I, 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 I kind of tongue in cheek want to write an article about how the arc was built. You know, playing on, um, and then you know, think about the, the I think where it is. It I think it's in either West Virginia or Kentucky where they actually have a replica and they built that enormous replica of the arc. So, um, I think that would be a kind of fun. So, what does that mean for this interim space? Right. What does that mean for one of these last areas of the 1500 acres that are UCI's campus that have somehow managed to not be micromanaged and regularized such that every square inch is irrigated and every every plant is trimmed just to the right height? Um, I don't know. Because yeah, these are historic resources that the university has accepted as such, what, uh, how do we move forward? It really is going to depend on who, what stakeholders decide to step up, um, whether a convincing plan, whether either to move these structures and rehabilitate them um, or to just do a full architectural, um, uh, investigation and um, uh, documentation of them. As it stands, they are in right now in, in serious disrepair. Um, and, you know, infested with rodents, we can't go in them. They're locked up, boarded up, though, obviously, some of it is full. And with the winter rains last winter, this area, particularly around the, the building B, um, gets pretty soft and squishy. Uh, part of that is the way in which the, the university has been channeling, re-channeling water through, through the campus. Um, so I don't know. But in the interim, we are able to do some of these excavations, able to engage students in thinking about their campus, its history, um, and what legacy they are interested in leaving. Um, Hopefully we can come up with a plan that at least will acknowledge that there are old buildings that sometimes happen in these brand new modern uh, facilities, as well as ideally bring in our indigenous neighbors to have actual decision-making power over, over these lands and these, and these properties. Um, so, <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Whether you're here in the room or there out in cyberspace, 
Um, I wish you all a good night. And let me just uh, add a few acknowledgements to the, you know, and my indebtedness to all of the students have, who have participated in the IDIG UCI program um, over the, then we're now in our third iteration of the course. So we're excavating um, and doing the training this, this quarter as well, um, as well as um, colleagues throughout the university who have helped with permissions as, and the, the logistics of actually making, um, yeah, allowing us to actually get students out into the archeological record and not just try and understand it vicariously through, you know, slideshows and presentations. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, um, I guess I could raise my hand. Um, I'm not sure what you're talking. Re reach out to the audience. There are several people that we've come across um, construction folks who actually were students at the home school. Mm. And they have um, raised awareness over the years of what that meant to them. So that would be fun. Um, I've done a lot of work on the campus, as I've shared with you before. Yeah. And we worked right there as they were doing the work. So that was a part of our team. Um, you need to get a hold of the site records and we're doing with this. Have you seen them? Because it tells that the, those buildings were eligible to the National Register. That was her decision. And that goes back to prior to our work, actually, what happened? In the 80s? Late 80s, early 90s, I believe. So the, I mean, it's certainly... Oh, excuse, excuse me, if anybody in the audience wants the to say something, amendment. could they get closer to the microphone? And again, with the amendment that came in 1997, there was a, a right. cultural impact um, uh, analysis. Right, but I don't know if they attached her site record. I have document. not seen that. Okay, definitely get a hold of that. I because don't that may have been part of the... In mitigation plan that they had set up, and um, so she did a full study. And the farm school, those buildings are related to the beginning of an insurance company. Yes, William Cheney. Yes, and I think that is the link. They gave a lot of my understanding. His know. daughter, his daughter gave I think eight million dollars in the nineteen eighties for the, right. the medical center, which at the time was the largest gift that right. the university had had. Yeah. Right. So that also to me is a link to the university and why those are remnants of that family and of course subsequent uses. But uh, I hope you can get uh, a hold of that. I, yeah, and I've been working with the the, the planning office and the um, to to try and get together whatever they still have. Right. Um, but they're now kind of in the third generation of the yes. I mean, so yes. that that institutional knowledge has started to to disappear. Mm -hmm. um, so we're so thank you. Yeah, I and mean, it's well, so the useful to have that. Did have a copy of it, but we ourselves have shrunk down, and I'm not sure I still have a copy of that particular mm -hmm. document because I did have it as we started to do the uh, documentation as they did the grading for the yeah. recreation center. Yeah. As I remember, we thought we would find more available where the uh, 4-H club and the horse and so forth. And so we were out there when they did the initial grading. Mm. Um, but we didn't come up with, you know, material. Mm. Uh, my my suspicion they probably still look for that or they did the grading. Well, thing. I think or they probably... pushed it out to where they were composting the, the green waste. Because um, one of the things we see in that wasteland area uh -huh. are some of the remnants of the those four H structures that have been reutilized as forts right. and um, you know uh, and temporary encampments for the unhoused and you know mm -hmm. one or two wild parties by undergraduates and stuff. Right. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, to me, certainly valuable for the university to maintain as a part of their history. Yeah. 
I, I, I would wholeheartedly agree. Um, whether it can happen where they where those where they sit as today, or whether they're going to have to be moved, is going to be an open question. And if they do need to be moved, at least we can. I, I hope that either my students and I can excavate the, the the where the buildings were, or that the university will actually hire you know, a firm to, to do that and you can and bring students to intern with them and things of that nature. Where is the timeline? No idea. What I do know is that the current long range development plan is set to expire in 2025. So a new one is in the offing. And that means that right now is probably the time that people are you know horse trading to get whatever pieces of land and why this is the moment that the Antigua Recreation Center is saying we want to expand because we want to make sure that we're in that that next long range development plan as the the the, the campus unit that's laying claim to this piece of property. Um, Ian, I'm not sure if you've reviewed the Greenwood and this, this is Doug McIntosh speaking. I'm not sure. Yeah. I'm not sure if you reviewed the Greenwood and Associates report prepared by Dennis. That was my last slide. Should I should I get out of the share mode? I am stopping uh, to share. I no longer oh. am sharing with you all. Hey, you I'm well, share no longer. <laughs> this is am I still here? Uh, if anyone has any questions for Ian. Uh, uh Ian, this is Doug Doug McIntosh. And uh, uh I'm not sure if you reviewed the Greenwood and Associates report prepared by Dana Slauson. And yeah, he he rec okay. he, he had uh in fact, I just had my students read it for this week um, so that they would uh, be able to, one, get a sense of what one of these impact analyses looks like. Um, but also, yes. He had presented, uh, Mr. Sloss, Dana Slauson, uh, he had presented that this property was associated with somebody important in Southern California history, unfortunately, uh, but for better or worse, with uh, insurance. <laughs> yeah, farmer's insurance. Dum -dum -dum. Yes, sir. Dum -dum. <laughs> And um, those two people that you have sitting in your audience, I'm very familiar with, and I, I love them both. They're uh, Beth and Chris Payton. And uh, I had the opportunity to work with them both at the, near the farm school site. And we were doing a project just, uh, I think it's north of the farm school site. And I was with Chris, Mr. Payton, who was, who was awesome. And Chris, Chris Payton and I, during the excavation of a waterline trench, came across uh, a very impressive. A very, we we came across a very important trash pit during the excavation for a waterline, and Chris, with his his digital camera, uh, documented um, the finds, and I was able to do profile drawings, and then we uh, recovered a sample. We couldn't recover the the. Um, Oh, let's say the wagon or the buried truck, <laughs> but we recovered some datable artifacts. But I think this is an extremely important site for the the campus of UCI, and I um, the artifacts are extremely diagnostic. Um, it shows that exactly what you spoke about in your 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 talk this evening. Of course, they weren't uh, depositing their trash on site but they were deposing it down slope mm -hmm. but we have extremely diagnostic artifacts that give extreme uh, important timelines or dates for artifacts um, farm artifacts um, there's uh, bottles and china and barbed wire etc cetera, etc cetera. but it shows the importance of the farm school property uh, before it was the farm school mm -hmm. And I've talking, I've spoken with people that attended, and and you and I have pro spoken privately. But I've spoken with people that attend the UCI Farm School, that are have been um, really impacted by the with the experience of the Farm School, and I really think that UCI needs to consider this in the future of their planning. Um, this is an important property that is not typical in Orange County that is still existing. 
and I, I I'm going to go on and on, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> I, I, and I thank you. I thank you, my friend Chris, for laughing at me. And letting the university know that we are paying attention. Um, if, if anything, that is a starting point. I'm um, going to say, hey, you know, it may not lead to the, you know, the kind of student protests of the 1960s over. No. Um, but it, it does say, wait a minute. If our goal as a university is to teach and train students and have them understand their world, let's start it where, where we live in, in, in your backyard. In your this, backyard, this, absolutely. This is a little island that is left on the UCI campus. And it's very unusual on the UCI campus, and it's and it's unusual in Orange County as an urban development. This is a little island of what something used to be. This this is extremely important. You don't have to agree with me or not. <laughs> I, I mean, I I do, but I, in the grand scheme of things, I don't really matter when it comes to because ultimately. These lands are controlled by the regents of the University of California. And if they say we need 800 more student dorm rooms, that's likely to take priority. But we might be able to at least come up with ways to either tweak whatever designs are happening or to find alternatives um, and hopefully I mean, one of one of the best ways to make you know the preservation and conservation a reality is to find a big, big pocketed donor who says, <laughs> "I want to be involved in in that." So, if you guys have any ideas of who we can hit up for about twenty million dollars, um, I'm all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I I appreciate your time, Ian, and thank you for taking the time to respond to my emails and to listen to me i really oh, appreciate it thank you this is why i do this so i i'm 200 miles away but my family re my family roots are from orange county and uh, i really appreciate that you have listened to me and like i said i've worked with both beth and chris payden and they're they have um uh unlimited expertise on the UCI campus as far as archaeology and paleontology but you I really appreciate that you've reached out to me and that you've spoken with me and I'm grateful for that and I I thank for the P, the PCAS they've always been grateful to uh very accepting of me too it looks like someone else would like to uh, ask, ask a question on Abby yeah, so I'm a former farm school student. I went there from, I think, 78 to 81. <laughs> and we did some very casual digging and we were mostly finding and we did a history of the campus. I don't know how well documented that was in the farm school archives. I remember finding a buried bus, which seems very strange, like, but maybe there's a bus there. Um, we also would go wander in the fields and find farm equipment and try to figure out what it was. And, you know, we rebuilt farm buildings. We we built a farm uh, and brought in farm animals, but from existing structures that had probably been there in the 60s. So there's, I don't know how much of that would be documented in the farm school records, but um, but also I was just wondering if you're, um, you know, uh, building any kind of uh, group to work on this site i went to a farm school reunion four or five years ago and we um there was some movement for to try to get uh former students involved and my husband's an architectural historian in um, san francisco so he was doing some research and we were talking about going down um robert katz a former colleague of mine here so we were sort of talking about trying to get a group of with different backgrounds to you know work on this site so i don't know if anyone's yeah. organizing yeah. something along those lines <laughs> Um, that's one fantastic that there's interest out there and there's support for um, to kind of champion the site in, in these ways. I don't know of any group that's actively you know, uh, lobbying in the back rooms of the university. Um, yeah. And it, it's probably a hard sell unless, again, you can bring, have. And we've lost your audio.
I lost my audio. Can you hear there me? There you go. Oh, I mean, I'll focus on this one. Um, that, uh, yeah, money, money talks. Yeah. Um, so, but, you know, one of the things that I think comes up in some of the, the, the archives and documents around the farm school, and particularly its closure, is how important it was for the parents and the, the, the students um, who, who were a part of it. And so, you know, that, that, that level of um, kind of grassroots organizing can, can, can make a difference in many, in many cases. Um, and I think it is special because it's not, you know, there are so, uh, w when I was there was when they were like taking historic buildings and putting them in like the historic petting zoos. And, you know, there are so few building sites that are in situ and tell a story of, you know, how the buildings work together and the site worked as a site, you know, so it's special that way. Absolutely. Um, who's I, you know, Beth, could you come closer to the mic, please, so we can hear you? Yeah, hi. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea, but I don't think it's something that Ian can organize being part of the faculty. So I just wanted to say yeah. that, that if Abby, you and your group organize as past um, students of the farm school, start yeah. your list of emails and so forth and that kind of activism, getting it to the university is obviously important. Is there I, any access to the site? I mean, to the actual building? Well, you I can walk right on it. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. can't go inside of them and you wouldn't want to. Uh, Could, yeah. Uh, you can probably students who are involved in the, the course and in the IWCI program are themselves going to to be you know interested and active especially given that it's likely that sometime later in the spring there's going to be a referendum about whether the arc will expand and what that might mean for this area the other piece of this that in just kind of the, the very local politics of it that red barn that is also right there that nice. actually is an active university building it is the dance barn it is you know overseen by the 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 school of the arts so presumably if there's going to be a transformation of that site that's also going to be impacted and that is uh, that that becomes a different story because that is an active university building versus these which have been essentially decommissioned um since 2007. Oh. Any other questions on your public comments in the chat? Ah, mm -hmm. oh, the chat. <laughs> They're mostly me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the, my husband's <laughs> newspaper research he did, he turned up is from an ostrich farm, the barn moved in the 60s. Okay. Does that ring true with what you found? The, the 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 red barn that's there currently yeah well i don't know i haven't seen the site recently but there was a red barn that was used by the um it was used by the uh what do you call it the uh, 4-h right i think that's a different one those barns, oh okay yeah okay. this is the one the, the one that's there was moved on site i think in the early 70s um and that was the barn where Pereira and the associates were uh, creating their master plans to take over the world. So. Oh, okay, I thought the the barn was where the 4-H was. They did hog slaughter. Actually, they asked us to come watch, and we didn't want to do that. You <laughs> <laughs> um, mentioned the replica of the ark. Somebody sent in. It's in Kentucky. Kentucky. I knew it was <laughs> Virginia or Kentucky. Yes. Okay, if there are no other, are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'll want to thank Dr. Strom for coming in.
and uh, appreciate it. I'm going to be. I thank you all for for sharing your your expertise and and experiences. So it's very helpful. I'm going to be I'm going to be sending you a certificate of appreciation for tonight's talk. And um, just give me a moment. I'll uh, um, announce next month's, which is November 9th, which is also going to be the election meeting. But we're having Dr. James Kennett back. He spoke to us many years ago. Um, it's got to be about 15 years ago or more on the Younger Dryas effect. And he's going to come back with um, all the new stuff that, that he's learned since his last visit to PCAS. So um, I'm not sure if that's going to be an in-person yet or not, but watch the newsletter and we'll let you know. But he's a great speaker too. So thank you, um, Ian, for, for, for tonight. We appreciate it. And thank everybody for joining us. If there's no other uh, questions or announcements, I'll say good night to everybody and have a safe drive home. Good night. Well, I don't have to drive home, <laughs> but I'm home. <laughs> hey, thank Take you, Ian. Thank you, Ian, thank for you your all. time. Appreciate and thank it. you, PCAS. Good night. Take, take care, Doug. It's good to see you again. I don't know if you remember me. I sure appreciate it. Yes, I do. You were, yeah, I bought some pottery from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. You're, thank you're the you artist know. that makes makes things out of copper. You're correct. You nailed, you got me. You have a good memory. Thank you. <laughs> but I, right. I wish you, I wish you a beautiful evening. Thank you. Take, take good care. All right. Take care. Appreciate it. Bye bye. Thank you all and good night. Good night. And Hi, contact everyone. me about Garden Grove. Oh, yeah. And, oh, we, we lost. Oh. The, we lost I'm still the here. I was going to invite him to come and see our little village there. Oh, I will when I'm back in Garden Grove. <laughs> it's 200 miles away. I know. <laughs> come by sometime. Uh, send Thank me a you note, all. please. Take care. Good night, everybody. Bye. Uh, yeah. <laughs>